So thanks for having us here. I'm going to invite you to turn to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. <clears throat> Darkness is kind of the overall theme that people talk about when they talk about Portland. It's a dark place. And so I and praying about uh, uh, Portland and the Lord to do a work. You know, I, throughout the Bible, there's many references to darkness and light and the world being a world of darkness and uh, John 3 19 and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil uh, John 8 12 then spake Jesus again unto them saying I am the light of the world Amen. John 12 46 I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness Amen. God put a distinction between darkness and light, and he used that as a way to demonstrate and show uh, the heart of man and the actions of man and the sinfulness of man as darkness and Jesus Christ and the works of Christ as light. And here in Acts chapter 26, we have Paul standing before King Agrippa, uh, able to talk now as he is brought uh, from place to place as they try to uh, put him to death and get rid of him because of the work he's doing and uh, he's standing before uh, King Agrippa, and then starting in verse 14, he gets to uh, talk about what, how transformation happened in his life. Amen. And verse 14, Acts chapter 26, it says, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against, to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Amen. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light." to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light Amen. and from the power of Satan unto God, Amen. that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Amen. To turn them from darkness to light. But uh, that very first couple words of verse, uh, verse 18, he says, to open their eyes. Um, <clears throat> I'm guilty uh, of... Not witnessing to people that I should witness to. Uh, we come across people every day of our life. Right. Every day, probably all of us come across people every day of our life that need to hear about Jesus Christ. Right. And uh, we see what happens on news and the way our country is going. And we can have this hatred towards sin, which is okay, we should have this disdain for sin and the actions of man and the sinfulness of man, but we got to be careful because that hatred towards sin and the sinfulness of man can be transferred over from the sin to the sinner. And I've uh, been guilty of that, especially when all the rioting in Portland happened. We uh, get this hatred of, ah, oh, those people, I can't believe they would do that. Uh, I can't believe they would act that way or say those things. Or uh, I was out door knocking, and I haven't come across this really at all, but uh, I was out door knocking and came across uh, probably 18, 19 year, a year old lady, young lady, that uh, was part of this satanic group. And she said her whole purpose, I tried to get her to try and tell me what she believed in. She didn't really believe in anything, but she basically was against anything that had to do with Jesus. And, I, you know, you think of these people and you just say, wow, uh, you just have this hatred towards uh, sin, but we got to be careful that we don't transfer that hatred towards the people, the sinner. Because we have to understand Jesus Christ loves those people. Amen. Jesus Christ died on the cross for this, those people. I've come across people when I share I'm going to Portland, and they say, oh, why are you going to Portland? We could just rub that city off the map and be good, you know. And I know it's a joke, you know, haha, -ha, but I'm just like, you really understand what you're saying. You're saying those people don't matter, that God didn't really die for those people. You know, uh, we can just do without that. Uh, God loves every one of those Amen. people. That's right. And we look at those people and we say, man, there's no hope. I mean, they're never going to believe in 
Christ, they don't, they're not going to listen to me. And I'm guilty of it. A lot of times we knock on doors and someone opens the door and it's a rough looking person. And you're probably like me and you say, this thought comes in your head like, oh, they don't want anything to do with what I'm talking about. But you try and just get the track to them. And I've come across those people and they end up being one of the most friendliest people I talk to. <laughs> and it's like, oh, I got to stop you know, putting labels on people, but we get, we're guilty of that and saying, oh, I don't want to share the gospel with them. And oh, they don't want to hear about the gospel. You saw the people on the video that I had there, and uh, you know, those were people that you wouldn't necessarily want to go up and talk to. Uh, they were rough looking, and you would say, oh, they don't really care about the gospel. They don't really care about the Bible. But every one of those people that I talked to, uh, they responded when I asked them about, you know, hey, I'm a pastor wanting to start a church in Portland, Oregon. What do you think about that? And I asked what I kind of just left the question up to just to see what they would say. And every one of those people said, oh, that sounds good. You know, we need churches in Portland. Amen. I'm like, what? <laughs> you, <laughs> you, and every one of those people said, that Amen. sounds like a good thing. You know, we Very could use work. more churches in Portland. And people, that shows me that people are seeking for something. Amen. They know what's going on isn't working. Right. What's happening, this, there's, they're not finding answers. And people Amen. are searching for answers. They're searching right. for help. And yes, they might not believe in Jesus Christ. They might say, oh, I don't believe the Bible has answers. Uh, the highest religion in Portland, Oregon is non-religious. 70% claim non-religious in Portland, Oregon. And I step back and I say, how am I going to reach people that are non-religious? You know, to me, that means they just don't believe in the Bible. They think it's a good history book, or Jesus is a good, you know, prophet, or some uh, man that lived many thousands of years ago, but they don't look at the Bible as God's word. So how do I reach those people? And they need to see in my life a love for them. And there's many people that won't pick up this book and won't read this Bible, but they'll read your life. They'll see God in your life, and that's how you're going to make a difference in their life. Um, here we see Paul, and he shares uh, his encounter with Jesus Christ. Amen. And I first want us to see that the gospel, the gospel is powerful. Amen. The gospel is powerful. Don't put God in a box. Don't put the gospel in a box and say, no, they... They're not going to get saved. Those people can't change. We see people in the way they're going and the way they live. And uh, there might even be some loved ones in your life that don't even care about Jesus Christ and won't even let you share the gospel with them anymore because you've tried and tried and you pray for them and pray for them and you think they're not going to get saved. I would like to remind you of Paul's life or before would be Saul. Right. As Jesus came to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest? Thou me. Amen. You see, Paul, Saul wasn't somebody that you would want to hang around with if right. you were a Christian. Uh, he says in verse 9, I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He, his, just like I said, I talked to that lady that was part of some satanic group and she was against the things of Jesus. That's what, Jesus, that's what Saul is saying here. I was out to do things contrary right. to the name of Jesus. Amen. It goes on in verse 10, which, things, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Who wants to go hang out with Saul? <laughs> I wouldn't want to go hang out with Saul if I was back then. Uh, but you know what? Saul needed the gospel. Amen. And even after he gets saved, you read throughout the Acts and uh, the book of Acts, and you read after his uh, encounter with Christ and he gets saved, and many believers that were told about Saul getting saved, they're like, wait, what are we? We're not going to that guy. <laughs> we don't trust him. And because uh, they didn't believe that he, could, he would get saved. And there's many people we see in this life, and uh, we're all guilty of saying, you know, I don't believe they're going to get saved. Right. And that's what Satan wants us to do. Right. Satan, when we have this hatred towards people that act in ungodly ways throughout our communities and on the news, and we say, ah, I can't believe people would act that way. Why are we so surprised? They're sinners doing what sinners know how to do. And that's why Paul, or Jesus says to Paul in verse 18, the very first part of that verse, to open their eyes. Because they're blinded. They, uh, it says to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. I realize as you talk with people that yes, they are blinded and yes, they are under the power of Satan. Right. Uh, Satan is out there working. We're in a spiritual battle. It's not a battle of flesh Amen. and blood. 
what we see going on in our country is not because we have to figure out some social experiment that we got to do to fix this problem. It's a spiritual problem, not a social problem. It's a spiritual problem. And that's how we're going to help our country. That's how we're going to see people saved and lives changed is by uh, preaching the gospel and getting them the word of God. But remember, look at Paul's life. It's, it's not going to be, I mean, it's possible for people to get saved of any any type of life, any lifestyle, right. they can get saved. And God can do a transformation work Amen. in their life. 1 Thessalonians 1, five says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power. Amen. In power. The gospel is powerful. Praise 1 Corinthians 6. Go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, <clears throat> I'll start reading through this passage. Verse 11 is what I really want you to see. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Sounds like a great list, right? You want to hang around those people? <laughs> that wouldn't be people I would say, yeah, you know, we got a bunch of uh, people that are uh, effeminate, idolaters and ad adulterers and uh, uh, feminine abusers of themselves, thieves, covetous. That's all of you guys. But what does verse 11 say? And such were some of you. Amen. That's a bold statement. I mean, if I were to go through this list and call out to you guys saying such were some of you. But that one, you guys would probably look at me like, who does this guy think he is? <laughs> uh, but that's not necessarily a terrible thing because the next phrase, but ye are washed, Amen. but ye are sanctified, Amen. but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Amen. and by the Spirit of our God. That's what he's trying to see here. It's to tell him, this is the life you lived. This is the way the direction of your life was, but there's been a transformation Amen. and now there's a different way of life you should be living. Hallelujah. And that's what's going on in our society. I hope when I start a church in Portland, Oregon, that uh, three, four years after I get that started, I can look out in the auditorium and say, yes, there's a bunch of idolaters, adulterers, thieves, covetous. Yes, a bunch of drunkards out here, but... Amen. They've been washed, amen? amen. They've been cleansed. They've been amen. sanctified in the name of Jesus Christ. Because that's where it's at. Uh, people are growing up in a godless society, even in America. Amen. When I was at the age of around 15, I uh, was able to witness to some kids in our VBS, uh, a brother and a sister. And I tried to share with them the gospel because they rose their hand and wanted to uh, know how to be, you know, wanted to be saved. And so I started to go through the gospel with them, but they had no idea about anything in the Bible. I even went to, all right, do you know about Noah and the ark? No, never heard about that. Adam and Eve, right? You've heard about Adam and Eve? No. And I'm like, how do I, because I tried to find out where they're at, what their understanding was, and where, how do I build upon that? And, you know, and so I just tried to give them Jesus Christ. I'm, I know they didn't get saved at that time, but I was Thought, thinking to myself at that age, man, there's kids that are growing up without any knowledge of the Bible. And now realize those eight, nine-year-olds, however old they were at that time, are now 29, 30, 35. They have kids of their own. And uh, those that didn't get saved, uh, they, they had parents at that age that didn't want to share the Bible with them. And now we have kids growing up in our society that don't just have parents that don't even care anything about the word. They have grandparents. And then they have great, even great grandparents that are just like, no, we don't believe in the Bible. And then why do we expect people to act righteous and religiously in our country? That's what's going on in our country. They need the gospel. But remember, the gospel is powerful. We have to understand that. But remember, there's a purpose for you. We see in Paul's life his powerful uh, conversion, but we see his purposeful conversion. In verse 16 of our text, in Acts chapter 26, it says, But rise, this is Jesus speaking to Paul, but rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. Amen. Yes, uh, man, lady, anyone who in here hasn't received Jesus Christ as their Savior, that's the most important decision you can make in your life. Right. If you don't know for sure heaven's your home, you need to make that decision because we don't know when our last breath might be taken. Amen. But Christian, are you fulfilling your purpose? Amen. Good. You have a purpose. Right. Amen. 
God saved you for a purpose. God has something for you to do. I hope you're not going through life just saying, oh, I, I'm not sure what I should do with my life. Uh, you know, there's been times where, you know, I pray to the Lord, where, where do you want me to do? You know, I had a lawn business that I started in uh, Oregon there because I was part-time at the church there in Salem. So I started a lawn business and the Lord blessed, and I was able to give uh, most everything from that business towards uh, faith promise giving, and uh, saw the Lord bless my business. And at one point, I was uh, even thought to myself, is this what you want me to do, Lord? Do you want me to just be a good businessman and be a good help in a church and just be a financial help to, uh, to missionaries and the work of the Lord? And that's, a good, that's okay to do if that's what God has called you to do. Is that your purpose? Then yeah, and I seriously prayed about it if that's what God wanted me to do. And I remember pushing that lawnmower one time and just saying, no, this isn't what God wants. God wants me to share the gospel and Amen. see people saved and be, start churches. You know, if, if God wants you to do that, that's a great thing to do. But what does God want you to do? I hope you, I hope you have settled that in your life or are at least praying about it right. Right. and what God wants you to do. You might say, oh, I got kids, I got a career, I got... My, my life is already going a certain direction, you know, I'm kind of just going with it. Well, you know what, when Jesus, you know, met the disciples, they had a direction they were going, and what did they do? They left their nets and followed him. Uh, there's many people throughout the Bible that forsook what they were doing and followed Jesus Christ, and their whole life changed, and that should happen when you get saved. Amen. There should be a change. There should be a transformation of the way your life is going. doesn't necessarily have to give up everything else in life and do something else. But there should be a transformation in the direction you're going in life to, uh, for God's purpose in your life. First, uh, 2 Timothy 1.8 says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Not according to our works, but according to his own grace, uh, purpose and grace. God has a purpose, and he has Amen. given you grace to fulfill that purpose in your life. Amen. And it's not according to your works. It's not according to what we can do. And uh, a lot of times we uh, make that a criteria of what we're going to do for God and our purpose for God. Well, I can't do that. I can't do this. I'm not good at that. I'm not good at this. So that must not be what God wants me to do. No, no. The Bible says not according to our works. Because if it was according to our works and our abilities and what we can do, when that's accomplished, what's going to happen? There's going to be the temptation to say, yeah, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm, <laughs> I can do these things. Yeah, it was me, you know. Uh, but it's not according to our works, according to his purpose. Throughout the Bible, you meet many people that had uh, disabilities in that area of ministry that God called them to. I think of Moses, uh, who God called to for a big work that he had for uh, Moses and he Moses said, "Nah, that's, I, I got a I got I got I got a speech speech problem. I can't. I, you got the wrong guy. That's that's not for me." And you see through his uh, early ministry of Moses that God had to get his brother Aaron to come help him along. And if you read the scriptures, who's doing a lot of the early miracles uh, before Pharaoh at that time? Was it Moses? No. It was Aaron. You see Moses kind of in the background, and Aaron's kind of, he's probably like, all right, Aaron, you're helping me out. You go talk. You know, I'll just, I'll be here. I'll pray for you. <laughs> you know, and he's just kind of back, and he sees Aaron doing these miracles that God is speaking through him. And then later on, you do see Moses come to this position where he is serving God, and he is uh, out there uh, speaking for the Lord and uh, doing what God has called him to do. But there was a growth that had to happen in his life, and God worked through that. And God's not looking for your ability as much as he's looking for your availability. Amen. Are you available to serve Amen. God and do what God wants you to do, even if it required leaving everything behind? And saying, all right, Lord, I'll do it. I'll step forward and fulfill that purpose. You want me to preach the gospel? You want me to go be, uh, start a church and be a pastor? You want me to be a youth pastor? You want me to just... Uh, commit to giving more towards mission, whatever it is. I hope you know what God's purpose is for your Amen. life and realize you have a purpose. Right. Don't yeah. live life saying, oh, I'm not sure what I should do with my life. Right. Know God's purpose for your life. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8. Let me show you this. It's just over a few pages. 
Acts chapter 8, and we'll finish up here. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. Here you have a man, Philip, in the middle of a revival, preaching for the Lord. I mean, great people are getting saved, great things are happening, and here's the Lord speaks to Philip in verse 26 and says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. All right, there you go. There's, your, there's what I want you to do, Philip. Does that make any sense to you? No, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, he says, go down to this place, and at the end he ends it, which is desert. You know, I went to West Coast Baptist College. It's in a desert area. It's not a place you'd want to be when you think of the landscape and the area around you. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's desert. Uh, and uh, here he has to go to this place. It's desert, you know, but I want you to go. And what does Philip do? The very next verse, and he arose and went. Amen. Yeah. And he arose and went. It doesn't have to completely make sense. I'm a lot, very logical guy. I love numbers. I'm crazy in that way. I know a lot of people are... Looking at me cross, I, I like taxes. Yeah. I, I worked at H&R Block, and I know a lot of people were like, oh, how can you do that? I'm like, this is cool, you know, calculating all this stuff and figuring things out. And, uh, but I like numbers in that way. I'm weird in that aspect. But, you know, I'm a very logical guy, and a lot of times I have to make sure things make sense and calculate out. And, our, you know, there's been many times we're on our, uh, what we're doing in deputation, it's just I had a Put that behind me and say, all right, Lord, we're just going to do this. You want us to do this. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, driving a big diesel truck and pulling a 37-foot travel trailer around the country. Well, all right, you want us to do this. We'll do it. <laughs> and uh, the Lord's blessed. And I've seen the Lord's hand. And he taught us a lot of patience. And a lot of uh, great things have come from it. And I've uh, learned a lot. Uh, but you know what? Uh, it doesn't have to make sense. He goes on and says in verse of uh, Acts chapter 8, verse uh, 27, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopia, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Paul, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Verse 29 again, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Amen. Go near and join thyself to this chariot. You know, if Philip didn't obey God to go to this desert place, there wouldn't have been that verse in there that says, then the Spirit sent him to Philip. Right. Amen. You know, God doesn't paint the whole picture and show us every detail of what God wants for us to do. I had no idea I'd go to Portland, Oregon. Even three years ago, I would say, I'm not going to Portland, Oregon. Uh, that's not what God wants me to do. Uh, but God showed and God revealed it in his due time and the timing of all that. And I know there was a time as I served at Salem Baptist, I planned to just be there for four or five years and seven years passed and it was getting close to eight years. And I'm just like, Lord, what do you want me to do? And uh, where do you want me to go start a church? Is that what you want me to do? do should I just stay here? And uh, the pastor, which is my father-in-law, he's uh, turn, turning 70 this year and he's you know, mentioned, you know, basically offered if I want to stay there and pastor the church, I'm welcome to, you know, and I'm just like, Lord, is that what you want me to do? And just, you know, trying to, and I've learned to wait on the Lord. Right. Be Amen. patient. The Lord teaches you a lot of these things. If, if you knew everything you need to, needed to know, you wouldn't learn the things that God wants you to learn. Uh, and so a lot of those things that don't make sense and you don't know about, it's because you have something you need to learn. Uh, deputation process, in my mind, didn't make sense to me. But I've learned a lot, and it makes sense now. And I see how the Lord has grown, not just myself, but our whole family through this whole process. It doesn't have to make sense. God can work through it. And so, Acts chapter 26, when he, uh, in verse 16 in our text here, he says, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. And he gives them some things. To make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things which, thou, which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. <clears throat> so he's called him to be a minister, that's simply a servant, 
someone who serves. Uh, God gave us a clear description of that in Matthew 20 when he said in verse 28, Even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. When he washed the disciples' feet, he gave a picture of uh, servant leadership and serving others. Uh, we need to be serving. We need to minister. It's going to take some effort. It's going to take some time. And it might even take some money to reach people with the gospel. But that's what God has called us to do is to minister. Uh, he said unto him to be a witness. Uh, to be a witness. A witness is simply uh, someone who has seen something. We think of an eyewitness. They saw an accident or a crime or something. And they have information because they were a witness of it. And uh, they would go interview that person to get the information they had that they experienced. And uh, we're called just to be a witness of what God has done in our life. Amen. Be a witness of God's work in your life. Right. And we're called to be an ambassador. And uh, in verse 17, it says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we have a uh, clear description in the Bible how God has called us to be an ambassador. In verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is simply, I love the, this uh, definition of an ambassador, a minister of the highest rank employed by one prince or state at the court of another to manage the public concerns of his own prince or state and representing the power and dignity of his sovereign. Right. Now put that in terms of the Bible. A minister... Of Jesus Christ, employed by God Himself at the court of another to manage the public concerns of Jesus Christ Amen. and representing the power and dignity of God Almighty. Amen. That is what we have the not just responsibility, but the privilege to do to represent Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And we can go out there and talk about That's why Paul said in uh, Romans 1, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That's why Paul was so, uh, could do these things, is he said, I'm not ashamed. Amen. And the last I want us to see, and brings me to as we are to be a witness, if you look at this chapter and you see what Paul is doing here, he has the, uh, he has the opportunity to stand before King Agrippa uh, to kind of, uh, get, out of the, get out of the situation he is. One of the most powerful men alive at that time. And if you read through this, he talks about how his upbringing as a Pharisee and how he was persecuting the Christians. And then Jesus came along his way and transformed his life and gave him this purpose. In verse 19, it says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, Amen. saying, I did what God called me to do, and this is why I've done what I've done. And... And when it gets down to it in uh, verse 26, for the king knoweth these things. Actually, go to verse 27. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. And he gets down to the point of what he's here for. You see, Paul didn't lose his vision of what God has called Amen. him to do. He had the opportunity to stand before the mo one of the most powerful men alive, and he didn't use it as a way to puff himself up or to get himself out of a situation or kind of beat around the bush. Right. Oh, he might get offended if I talk about Jesus, so I'm not going to say anything. Let me just try and get out of this situation so I can get back home. He said, no, this is, God has given me an opportunity to stand before King Agrippa, and he needs to hear about Jesus Christ. Because King Agrippa, did, he believed the scriptures, the Old Testament that they had at that time. That wasn't the problem. The problem was... Do you believe in Jesus, Amen. King Agrippa? What right. do you think about Jesus? And one of the most saddest verses, verse 28, and Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. You see, it's not our responsibility to save people. That's their decision between God and themselves. But it is our responsibility to be a witness. Amen. And as you see through this chapter, what is Paul simply doing? He's simply sharing his testimony. Amen. He's simply, simply sharing what he knows right. and what he has experienced and how God worked in his life. And I want to share with you, uh, brother and sister, one of the most powerful things you have as a witness for Jesus Christ is your testimony. Right. Praise the Lord. A lot of times we say, oh, I don't know what to say to somebody, my coworker, my neighbor. Uh, I just don't know those verses or I don't know. Uh, I don't have a three-point outline that's alliterated. You know, I can't do this. How do I, you, know, <laughs> you don't have to have all those things. Yeah, get, get, know the Bible, know the verses. I'm sure you have tracks that have it laid out nicely uh, to help them follow along. But you know what? When it comes down to it, just share with them what you know. Amen. What, is, what does Jesus Christ mean to you? 
What is salvation to you? Amen. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the most powerful thing you have is your testimony. Because Amen. it's nobody else's. It's yours. Right. Amen. It's what Christ did in your Praise life. And just share that with people. Amen. People need the power of the gospel. Praise people need to Lord. hear about Christ. Amen. What are you doing to share that gospel with That's them? Good. If you're not saved today, you need to get saved. Amen. God, today is the day of salvation, right. the Bi God says in the Bible. You need to get saved. And if you are saved, are you fulfilling God's purpose for your life? Amen. Do you know what God wants you to do? Maybe you just need to really pray about it and make sure you are living what God Amen. wants you to do. Right. And uh, if not, maybe you need to, yeah, just find out what God wants you to do and live for it. Maybe the Lord's working on your heart to be a pastor, to go start a church, to go uh, be a youth pastor, to, to start a ministry here in uh, Dover, Delaware. Maybe there's something that's burdened your heart for a neighborhood, and you say, you know what, we need to start a parks ministry or uh, start this ministry to reach kids or the, work in the public school system. Uh, there was a lady that uh, wanted to start working in a public schools after school program, and it was going to start the fall of 2020. And... She was in the middle of working on getting all the certification for all that at the beginning of the year, and then COVID hit. And so we had to rethink that, so we started this, uh, the program at our church down the street from the school because we weren't able to use the school. And so we just said, oh, let's figure it out and figure it a way to get the gospel to these uh, kids. But find out what God wants you to do. Live God's purpose for your life. Right. And she shared the gospel. Share the gospel with people. Amen. You know, it's not about, you know, when I go start churches in Portland, I, I'm not going to be like, yes, it's, I got to reach 800,000 people. That's my job to reach 800,000 people. No, that's our job as Christians Amen. to reach people with the gospel, right. to reach your city uh, of Dover, Delaware, to reach this area for God. It's not your pastor's responsibility right. by himself. Amen. It's your, our responsibility as Christians to see Praise people saved Amen. and see lives changed. Right. And what are you doing your part to see your city, your neighborhood, Amen. your workplace, where God has put you to see people saved? You're, I'm not going to be able to reach into your bubble of people that you know to see right. them saved. You're not going to be able to reach to the people that I know to be saved, but we can work together to see all Praise those people saved Amen. and see lives changed and God do a great work in our Amen. country. What are you doing for the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. in this area?